Thank you for joining me today. My name is Shelley Arnott, and I'm a professor in the biology department at Queens. I'm also associate director at CUBES. Today, I'm going to talk to you about some research that we've been doing on the impact of road salt on aquatic communities. As my title suggests, our research results indicate that zooplankton in lakes are far more sensitive than we thought and are likely already impacted by years of road salt application. Before I begin talking about our research, I want to remind you of how fortunate we are to live in a country that's rich in aquatic resources. Approximately 20% of the world's fresh water is found in Canada. And I really like this map because I think it does a great job illustrating this. So the map shows the percent coverage by water in watersheds across the globe, with the dark blue color indicating watersheds with more than 10% coverage in, in water. The Canadian Shield is striking because of the amount of water that it holds, and you can see that it's covered in a dark blue color. And in many regions, such as the Muskoka Halliburton region that's north of Toronto, there, the landscape is as much as 15% covered in water. And of course, water provides a number of important ecological resources and services for us. And this includes drinking water, the generation of hydroelectricity, um, irrigation of crops, and various forms of recreation from swimming to boating to, to fishing. Now, despite the economic, ecological, and cultural importance of water, lakes, and streams, many of them are facing challenges associated with nutrient loading, climate change, pollution, invasive species, and habitat alteration. And one issue that's recently emerged um, as a concern is that chloride concentrations are increasing in lakes and streams across North America. Now, here's an example from Lake Simcoe, which is Ontario's largest freshwater lake next to the Great Lakes. And there are several cities located on its shoreline, including Barrie and Aurelia, and the lake serves as an important hub for recreation. Now this pattern that we see is common across North America, particularly in lakes that are near roads and urban areas. And the graph um, that's shown here shows the standardized chloride concentration for 36 lakes in North America that have long-term chloride data. And as with Lake Simcoe, there's an increasing trend through time in chloride concentrations. Now to improve winter driving and walking conditions, in Canada we apply as much as 7 million tons of salt to the roads each year. And uh, just for reference, a salt truck can hold um, 10 to, to 14 tons. So we apply half a million salt trucks full of salt across Canada. Now to remind you of how road salt works, to be an effective de-icer, road salt must dissociate into um, two components, the chloride and the sodium ion. And it does this in water. And so salt doesn't actually melt ice, it just prevents ice from forming by lowering the freezing temperature. And so it only works when water already exists. And so this could be before the temperatures drop below zero, or it could happen when ice melts in the sun or because of friction from car tires on the, on the road. So as I mentioned, salt lowers the freezing point of water to um, minus 21 degrees Celsius. And this process is known as the freezing point depression. Now the way it does this is by interfering with water molecules ability to bind together to form ice. So sodium chloride does this um, most effectively when it's applied at temperatures that are above minus, um, minus 12 degrees Celsius. And after that, it's, it's less um, able to prevent the formation of, of ice. Now the diagram here shows water molecules both in the liquid and the ice form. And when sodium chloride ions are present, and they're shown in orange, they interfere with the formation of those ice crystals so that hard ice isn't able to form until minus 21 degrees Celsius. Unfortunately, salt that's applied to road surfaces doesn't just stay on the road. Because it's soluble in water, it, it flows to lakes and streams in winter and spring through stormwater systems and overflow overland as snow and ice melt. And it slowly moves through the year through soil water and groundwater. 
Because of this mo movement, we see dramatic short-term increases in chloride concentrations in rivers and more gradual long-term increases in lakes that are near highways um, and parking lots. So road salt can impact freshwater ecosystems through the loss of sensitive species, particularly small invertebrates like this Daphnia species shown here. So and associated with these changes is a loss of ecosystem services that include um, increased algal growth that's likely due to the loss of important grazers like Daphnia and a shift in algal species towards bloom, bloom, forming, um, bloom forming cyanobacteria. Increasing chloride can also impair drinking water either directly through increased salt levels or indirectly through the increase in toxic algal blooms. So why do we care about road salt being applied to the built up and natural environment? Well, one important reason is that road salt is highly corrosive and can cost billions of dollars in infrastructure damage. Cars in North America have a limited lifespan. And one reason for this is the rust caused by salt. So it's estimated that um, rust to the body and to the mechanical parts of cars cost car owners um, approximately $847 a year. Salt corrosion also results in costly repairs to highways and bridges. For example, um, $4.2 billion in repairs for the Champlain Bridge in Montreal and $12 million per year in repairs to the Gardner Expressway in Toronto. And finally, this damage has also cost um, us in terms of human lives. In 2012, the roof of the Algo, Algo Center Mall in Elliott Lake collapsed, killing two people and wounding others. And the reason this happened was because salt from the rooftop parking lot leaked into the structural supports and corroded the metal framing, allowing the, the roof to collapse. Okay, so what are the concentrations of chloride in lakes in Ontario? Is this something that we have to worry about? This map shows the concentration of chloride in several, several hundred recreational lakes in Ontario. The green small dots represent lakes with very low concentrations of chloride, so less than five milligrams per liter. About 20% of the lakes have concentrations between 5 and 40 milligrams per liter, and these ones are shown with the blue dots. And less than 1% of the recreational lakes have concentrations higher than this, and th these are shown in orange and red. So you'll notice that this map doesn't include lakes in southern Ontario around the GTA, which would have much higher concentrations. And that's because these data are from important recreational fisheries lakes and lakes with cottages. So they represent just a subset of the, the lakes in Ontario. Okay, so with this map in mind, we were interested in determining if increasing chloride resulting from road salt is a problem in the quarter million lakes on the Canadian Shield um, that are important for recreation. Now, Canada actually has pretty strict water quality guidelines aimed at protecting aquatic life. For chronic or long-term exposure, the guideline for chloride is set at 120 milligrams of chloride per liter. And for acute or short-term exposure, it's set at 640 milligrams per liter. So based on that, um, you might expect that aquatic organisms in 99% of the recreational lakes in Ontario that we looked at at the previous map would be protected. Well, my research lab thinks that these guidelines might not actually protect organisms in Canadian shield lakes. And I'll show you examples from several studies that support this conclusion. So we've conducted lab studies using six different species of um, Daphnia and um, individuals of one species that were sampled from six, 10 different lakes. We've also conducted field experiments using zooplankton communities from two lakes, one that's located on Cube's property and one that's in the Muskoka region. And we did these experiments in the context of a larger global experiment, um, which demonstrates the sensitivity of chloride and two chloride is widespread. And then finally, we looked at the historical changes that have occurred in zooplankton community composition in a lake in Muskoka that happens to be adjacent to an important highway. 
So my hope is that with these results, I'll be able to convince you that we need to question the current water quality guidelines for chloride and take action to reduce the amount of road salt that's being applied to roads and other paved surfaces. So first, let's look at how water quality guidelines are determined. They're typically based on a group of lab tests where some, um, some response like survival or reproduction of a species is determined at a, across a range of different concentrations. So the response of individual species is measured at each dose, and the responses are usually based on mortality or survival um, or reproduction. And from the relationship that's plotted based on these experiments, you can determine the highest concentration where there's no effect or the lowest observable effect. The low observed adverse effect level is often defined as the concentration where there's a 10% or 25% reduction in survival or mortality or some other response that's been measured. Now the water quality guidelines for chloride are based on this type of data from 28 different species that were tested for chloride effects in the lab. The concentration where the lowest effect occurs is then plotted for each individual species in a cumulative species sensitivity curve, which is shown here. The species on the left um, bottom of the curve are the ones that are most sensitive to chloride, where the species on the right um, um, top corner are the least sensitive. Now, um, this distribution is comprised of 28 different species that include fish, amphibians, invertebrates, and plants. And I've highlighted in blue down two species of Daphnia, Daphnia magna and Daphnia pulex. And these are typical species that are used for toxicity tests. Now, the water quality guideline was then determined based on this curve so that 95% of the species would be protected. And that's shown where this blue arrow is. And what this means then is that at chloride concentrations of 120 milligrams per liter or less, there should be no effect um, on any of the species that were tested. So based on this, we would assume that our current water quality guidelines should do a pretty decent job of protecting aquatic organisms in Ontario. So why are we questioning the validity of these guidelines? And there's two main reasons for it. First is the um, based on the species that were tested. So I pointed out that the two um, uh, species related to the work that we do um, are Daphnia magna and Daphnia pulex. Now Daphnia magna, like I said, is a typical species that's used in lab toxicity tests, but it isn't even found in boreal shield lakes. And so it may not be a good species to, to um, represent those organisms. Daphnia pulex is another common species used in toxicity tests, but it's mostly a pond species and doesn't occur in the larger um, deep clear lakes that we have on the shield. The second reason is related to water hardness. And water hardness is the amount of, um, of ions, particularly calcium, that's, that's in the water. And so for these toxicity tests, the, the media that they, they use to grow the organisms is typically between 40 and 180 milligrams per liter of hardness, which is measured as calcium um, carbonate. Um, and the, we think that might not be um, an appropriate media to use, especially because lakes on the Canadian Shield are, are, have very soft water. So their hardness is typically between 10 and 13 milligrams of hardness as calcium carbonate. And so before I get into the experiments, I want to tell you a bit more about the organisms that we're studying. I've mentioned Daphnia a few times, um, and these are a type of, of zooplankton. So this ish slide shows a very simplified um, food chain for, for a lake. So zooplankton are in the middle of the food chain, transferring energy from algae to higher trophic levels such as fish. So zooplankton are important because they can determine the amount of algae in the lake through grazing. So if there's lots of zooplankton, there'll be um, fewer algae and therefore clearer lakes. 
And zooplankton are also an important food source for higher trophic levels like fish. So again, if there's fewer zooplankton, then there's not as much food available to support fish populations. So for the first study I'm going to talk about, um, we used six different Daphnia species that are commonly found in Canadian shield lakes, and we exposed them in the lab to seven different concentrations of chloride. We grew them in a soft water media that was designed to reflect the chemical composition of lakes on the Canadian shield. So there was low calcium concentrations as well as other ions. We fed the Daphnia every day and monitored their survival and reproduction for a total of 21 days. So one of the um, results that we looked at were, um, was reproduction. And so we looked at the total number of neonates or the total number of babies that were produced for each individual over the course of the 21 days. And what we found was that reproduction was impaired at concentrations well below the Canadian water quality guidelines. So the total number of neonates or babies produced for all species was 64% lower um, at 120 milligrams per liter, which is the water quality guideline, than our control, which represents um, a typical lake water. And this effect was even stronger for one particular species, Daphnia mendote, which is quite common in Canadian shield lakes. And it suffered a 100% reduction in um, reproduction at 120 milligrams per liter of chloride. We also looked at mortality. Now these results show the chloride concentration where 50% of the Daphnia died um, during that 21 day period. So we've indicated where the water quality guideline is in that with, with the red dashed line. And you can see that all of the Daphnia in our experiments had an LC50 below 120 milligrams per liter of chloride. So half, over half of the Daphne are dying before we reach the water, current Canadian water quality guidelines. And we got the same result when we looked at um, 10 different lines from a single species of Daphnia pulicaria. So we looked at nine different lines from uh, lakes in Muskoka, and then we had one line from a lake in Sudbury. And all of the clone lines had LC50s below the current water quality guideline for chloride, except um, the one in the, from the lake in Sudbury. So I think that these results provide strong evidence that current water quality guidelines for chloride might not adequately protect aquatic life. Using these laboratory experiments, we found um, reduced reproduction and reduced survival at chloride concentrations well below the current water quality guidelines. But um, there are some caveats with that. These are lab-reared cultures. Um, so they don't really represent um, what's going on in the, in the lake. The environmental context is very simple. There's no species interactions and no predators. They're, they were given lots of food um, and you know, controlled temperature and, and light. And so while we trust the results of these data, we don't know if they apply to actual lake conditions. And so to address this, this issue, we conducted um, field mesocosm experiments um, using zooplankton from two different lakes. Um, these were conducted by two master's students in my lab, Daniel Greco and um, Alex McClymond. And they used um, 30 mesocosms and they set them up so that they had a gradient um, ranging from the lake concentration to 1,500 milligrams of chloride per liter, so a really high concentration. And they, um, they stocked them with zooplankton um, and they monitored the response of the zooplankton to the various chloride con conditions for six weeks. The two study lakes were, were Long Lake, which is um, located on the property at, um, at Cubes, and the other was Paint Lake, which was in, is in the Muskoka region in south central Ontario. Now I'm just going to show you the, um, the results for um, Cladocerin abundance. And what I have here 
um, is, are the results for Long Lake and Paint Lake side by side. By side. And um, it's showing the reduction in um, cladocerin abundance as the chloride concentration increases. And you can see that in both Long Lake and Paint Lake, as soon as chloride concentration started increasing, we saw a decrease in, in abundance. And when we looked at what that um, what decrease there was at the current water quality guidelines, we found that in Long Lake, there were 62% fewer cladocerins at the current water quality guidelines, and in Paint Lake, there were 48% fewer cladocerins. So clearly, the current water quality guidelines are not protecting zooplankton in these, in these lakes. Now, of course, these are just two lakes, and we were interested in determining how um, generalizable these results were. And so we teamed up with researchers from um, four, um, four different countries, um, from Canada, the US, Spain, and Sweden. So in total, there were 16 different sites, and you can see some examples of some of the, um, the experimental mesocosms that were used among, among the different sites. And we all conducted the um, same um, experiment and using the same experimental design. Each site used 20 to 30 outdoor mesocosms, and we all had the same chloride gradient ranging from ambient to 1500 milligrams per liter. We did the same, um, used the same sampling protocol. So we sampled um, the experiment for six weeks and we looked at water chemistry and zooplankton. And, um, Last fall, we got together at Elbow Lake um, at Cubes, and we pooled our results, analyzed it, and are currently writing a paper based on this. And I'll show you um, one of our results. So this is the LC50 for cladocerins. And so what this represents is the um, chloride concentration where there's a, a loss of 50% of the, um, the cladocerin abundance. And what I've um, plotted here is these, the LC50 for the cladocerins versus, um, for each of the 16 different sites. And um, the, the red lines, the red horizontal lines represent the Canadian water quality um, guideline for chloride in the solid red, and the dashed red is the American water quality guideline. So 120 versus 230 milligrams of chloride per liter. And the points that are um, in red are the points that um, where the confidence interval overlaps the water quality guidelines. So what this means is that in these, in these sites, that we lost 50, at least 50% 50 of the, the cladocerin abundance at the water quality guidelines. Now there were four points that are in black and these are um, from different locations, uh, Sweden and um, California, where the Daphnia there were less sensitive and were able to tolerate higher concentrations of, of chloride. So in conclusion, we from the, this study, this combined study, we found that there was some variation in sensitivity among lakes, um, but that at most sites, those of, so 12 of those 16 sites, cladocerins um, were vulnerable, even at the current water quality guidelines. And so I think this suggests that um, we may need to rethink our guidelines. But again, this is uh, an experiment. They're conducted not in the lake, but in, in mesocosms, so um, you know, fairly small containers, um, although outside in natural conditions. And so we wondered if there was actual evidence um, of declines in, in cladocerins in, in lakes that are experiencing increases in chloride. And so, where we looked was in Jevons Lake. And Jevons Lake is located adjacent to Highway, 20, or Highway 11, which is um, right near Gravenhurst. And um, it has one of the highest chloride concentrations in Muskoka. And so Robin Velo, a 
PhD student working with John Small and Andrew Patterson at the um, uh, MOE has examined cladocerin remains in a core that was taken from Jevons Lake. And she compared the community composition through time using what's called a principal components analysis. So this graph is showing the community structure, which is represented by that principal component analysis um, and looking at the changes through time. So the red vertical um, line um, shows where road salt application started. So it started in, in um, Muskoka and, and other places in North America around the 1940s. And so you can see that um, as soon as road salt started to be applied, there is a change in the cladocerin community. And this result is consistent with our laboratory and our field mesocosm experiments. The community starts to change soon after road salt began, so at relatively low concentrations. And so from this, um, we think we have very strong evidence to suggest that the current water quality guidelines don't protect zooplankton in, in all lakes. And this is supported by our laboratory experiments where we looked at multiple species of Daphnia in multiple populations. It's supported by our field experiments in multiple lakes around the world. And finally, it's supported um, through the historical reconstruction of cladocerin communities in um, Jevons Lake. Okay, so I've shown you that I don't think the water quality guidelines are adequately protecting lakes. Um, so what can we do? You know, salt is recognized as a toxic substance, but it's also play, it also plays an important role in maintaining public safety. And so the goal is to, that we have to, um, the goal that we face um, or, or challenged by is that we have to balance public safety with um, ecological protection. And so I think there's different things we can do and Environment Canada has, um, has su suggested a bunch of ways that, that we can reduce the, the likelihood of salt getting into lakes. So one of them is through um, salt storage, proper salt storage. And so um, Environment Canada has uh, mandated that that salt, um, any salt that's stored should be under a roof and on an impermeable pad. And so the goal is to have 100% compliance and um, right now we're at 95%. So it's looking pretty good. Another thing um, is to have salt trucks with um, ground speed electronic controllers so they can regulate the amount of salt that's distributed onto, onto the roads. And so far there's good compliance with that, so 94% um, of the trucks are able to use these controllers. Another method is to pre-wet um, or pre-treat the, um, the roads with, with salt. And the reason that this um, works is because, as I mentioned, salt only works um, in water. So it doesn't melt the ice, it prevents it from melting. And so if you either um, pre-wet the, um, the roads or apply a salt brine, you can get away with using way less, like 50% less salt on the, on the roads. And so right now there's good compliance with that 67% of the salt trucks are, are using pre-wetting or pre-treated salts, and 58% um, of the vehicles are, are equipped for pre-wetting. Pre so that's, I think that's good news. The other area of concern deals with um, private lots, and this is um, very unregulated right now. And so I think there's lots that we can do to control the amount of salt that's put on um, sidewalks and parking lots. And I'm sure you've all seen pictures of, or seen it yourself, you've gone out, stepped out onto a, a parking lot and you're crunching on salt rather than crunching on snow. So there's a few guidelines I think that would work um, um, for reducing the amount of salt used there. One is that um, you know, salt is only effective um, at warmer temperatures. And so if the temperatures are less than 10, negative 10 degrees Celsius, then it doesn't make sense to use salt there. Um, another um, way to reduce the amount of salt is to ensure 
proper drainage of water. And so if there's a slope to the parking lots that allow water to drain off, then it's not going to freeze and you're not going to need as much salt to, um, for de-icing. Um, another method would be to re um, remove as much snow as possible um, so that you get more effective de-icing. So rather than applying salt onto a snowy, um, a snowy parking lot, um, shovel it first. Um, there is also a recommendation um, to apply um, you know, 1.5 to 3.5 kilograms per hectare um, on surfaces, um, depending on the, the temperature. And for sure, way more is being applied than that. And, and so one way to tackle this is to ensure that contractors who are in charge of, of um, clearing parking lots and applying salt have had salt training so that they know how much to apply and how much is effective and at what temperatures it's most effective. And then finally, I think there's things that we can all do to reduce the amount of, of salt. Um, this is a picture that I took walking into the bioscience building at Queens, and you can see that the sidewalk is covered in salt. And I can assure you that is way more salt than we need um, to have effective de-icing. And so some simple measures that everyone can take, shovel snow, don't over apply salt like you see here. Um, Pre-treat, so you could use a brine mix. Um, another thing we could do is to wear boots with good traction. When we're driving on roads, um, have winter tires and drive cautiously. Maybe we don't need to drive 120 kilometers down the, the, down the highway when conditions aren't ideal. And I think if we, if we concentrate on reducing the amount of salt we're using that the lakes will be um, in far better condition for it. So with that, I would like to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. And I would also like to acknowledge um, the, the students um, and field assistants and lab assistants that helped with this project, as well as um, funding agencies and, and um, other agencies that provided logistical support. Thank you.